I'm Jacqueline Looney, and I serve as Senior Associate Dean for Graduate Programs. Thank you for joining us for the fifth Race and Bias Conversation. The Graduate School has been hosting these dynamic, engaging discussions since October. We have covered the desegregation of higher education, the policing of our communities, strategies for achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion, structural inequality, and now today, how senior leaders in higher education approach the work of diversity and inclusion. All of these have been recorded and today's, and today's discussion will also be added to the recordings on the Graduate School's website. The pandemic, the economic crisis, and the nation's racial reckoning have laid bare the racial disparities that continue to, to exist in this country. Senior leaders in higher education are challenged to respond in innovative ways to address e these issues on our campuses. In today's conversation, we have two distinguished Duke Graduate School alumni serving in higher education diversity and inclusion roles who will discuss their work and how they are addressing racism, bias, and inclusion at their respective institutions. After introductions of the speakers, we will start the conversation with questions for them, and I will start those questions. Please post your questions in the chat, and Deans Kendrick and Bostrom will prompt me on them. And Melissa and Alan, I ask you, if I ask a question and it seems to be a related follow-up, I will let you all chime in and, and, and ask that follow-up question for me. So now to introductions. Dr. Elizabeth Horge Freeman is a senior advisor to the president and, and, provost for, and provost for diversity and inclusion at the University of South Florida and is also associate professor in the Department of Sociology. Her first book, The Color of Love, Racial Features, Stigma and Socialization in Black Brazilian Families received awards from the American Social, Sociological Association. She has co-edited a volume on race and politics and has many published journal articles and book chapters in her discipline. She is the recipient of numerous research fellowships and has been recognized for her outstanding teaching. Dr. Horge Freeman received her BA from Cornell in Spanish and Biological Sciences and her MA and PhD in Sociology from Duke University. Dr. Horge Freeman. Dr. George Wright, is Senior Advisor to the President and Interim Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Kentucky, that of a blue, but it's not Duke blue, as we know. <laughs> okay, he holds the rank of Distinguished University Research Professor. Previously, Dr. Wright was Professor of History at Texas A&M University in College Station. He has taught at a number of institutions over the years, the University of Kentucky, the University of Texas at Austin and Duke University. He served as executive vice president and provost at the University of Texas at Arlington and was president of Prairie View A&M University. Dr. Wright has authored books on race, relations in Kentucky, I think there are three. He is a highly decorated academic receiving awards and honors from many of the institutions at which he has served. Dr. Wright received both his BA and his MA degrees in history from the University of Kentucky and his PhD in history from Duke University, University, Dr. George Wright. He's also a member of the Graduate School's Board of Visitors. Welcome you both to Duke University. So here's where we start. Our, some, somebody had a question? Okay. I want the two of you, and I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Wright. Talk about how you decided to take on the diversity and inclusion position at your institutions as senior advisors to the president. What does it mean to be a senior advisor and what was your thinking process to decide to take on these positions? We'll start with you, Dr. Wright. Okay. Uh, in July of last year, 2020, uh, I was appointed uh, to two positions at the University of Kentucky distinguished research professor in the Department of History, and second, senior advisor to the president, where I would be working primarily with the president and provost on any number of different issues that they were involved in. About a month after that, the vice president for diversity uh, became 
provost at a, at a university in Michigan. And so I was asked for this year to step in to lead a new effort that the university had just started. At the July board meeting, uh, the University of Kentucky had launched its diversity, equity, and inclusion implementation plan. And it consisted of six different uh, work streams and 17 different projects. So here it was. I was brand new back to the University of Kentucky. And at the same time, I had been asked to undertake as the leader of this new initiative. So it was a daunting task, but one that I agreed to do for this year. And I'm sure at some point you'll get you'll ask some specifics about exactly oh, what absolutely. Doing. Okay, Elizabeth. Cool. Yeah, well, let me, let me first start by just thanking you uh, for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. And I have to recognize my mentor and advisor, Dr. Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who is here. So I can't go for it without recognizing you. And um, uh, let me also recognize Eduardo as one of the recipients for the Dean's Award for Excellence in Mentoring. And I think the year Eduardo received the award, Dean McLean, who was not Dean at the time, also received that, that, that award. So I wanted to recognize that. No, it, it's definitely not. Hello, uh, Professor McLean. So, the, so the question is, how did I end up doing this? This was this is actually really quite coincidental. Um, the summer of George Floyd's uh, murder actually followed when I was leaving sabbatical. So I had just finished the book that I had been working on for the past ten years and getting ready to transition back into campus. When in fact, one of my students on campus an Afro-Latino student who's actually my, my advisee was stopped on campus, um, had his, was handcuffed, was detained and had a dog uh, come out to sniff his car because of the belief that he had heroin um, mm -hmm. or some type of drug in his car. So when that happened, just a week or so after George Floyd, it, I felt compelled to act. And what, what I ended up doing is starting to draft a letter on behalf of black faculty and staff at my university and pinned it to the president and provost. Uh, so we had this letter and about a hundred black faculty and staff signed this letter. Our president and provost responded 20, 24 hours within that and they asked to meet with me to talk about the call to action letter. And so that initial conversation led to other conversations with me and led to me um, facilitating the development of what were called interlocking priorities that this group of black faculty and staff came up with. And we submitted this and you know, all of those conversations actually led to them creating this inaugural position of senior advisor to the president and provost for diversity and inclusion, which, which leads me to where we are now. Now, fortunately, the books that I write, the articles that I write all deal uh, with racism. And so um, they deal with racism from an intersectional perspective. And so those sensibilities certainly lended themselves uh, for me being tapped to do this uh, responsibility. So that's, that's how it, that's how it started. Um, I've always been interested in moving into administration, although I didn't necessarily think it would happen so quickly, um, but um, it was certainly something that I had, I had thought about and wanted to do. So it sounds like both of you were like the faculty members in the right place for the moment mm -hmm. and were willing to step in. Uh, both of you do research on race Mm -hmm. um, and, and, so, and so it's really interesting. And this is very important because for the students who have joined us, uh, I think it's very important for them to see how sometimes these positions develop, evolve. Um, uh, so it, sound, it sounds like the moment. Mm -hmm. My next question has to be, so you're both there. Uh, you know, George, the person left, you stepped in, you said, I'll do this for the year. Right. Elizabeth, there was a situation involving your student, mm -hmm. and you 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 sent probably this um, just a compelling statement to the leadership of your university, and so that you okay you're it. Mm -hmm. So now that you're both it, tell us how you are building a network of support, and okay. who do you have as allies, okay. and who do you see as potential allies. Okay. If, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention this. Uh, at the University of Kentucky, uh, I mentioned that the Board of Trustees meeting, it, this was announced, and the university said this would be one of its two major priorities with restarting the university in the COVID environment being the other one. But DE&I would be 
equally as important as that endeavor. Um, the university then said that I and the others who would be involved, they had named some other people to work with me, that we needed to inform the community. So during the month of August, we met with all of the university stakeholders, and this would even include uh, people in the city of Lexington, and we asked for nominations for the 17 different projects and over 800 people were volu uh, volunteered to participate. So we had to work our way through that. But yet at the same time, there was a certain level of skepticism because so many people said, well, the university has said before it was committed to doing this type of work. And after six months, a report would be issued and that would be the end of that. So not only did we have to get the work started, we had to convince everyone that we were committed to this. The, the other quick comment is that the board of trustees who had endorsed this also said that they agreed with us that all of the leadership should go through anti-bias training, including themselves. And so the president and 50 of us went through uh, two sessions for a total of eight hours of anti-bias training. And the board of trustees also went through anti-bias training as well. And we're now committed to doing 250 other leaders uh, of the university this, this year, 2021. Wow, that, that's impressive. Elizabeth? No, that, that's, that's amazing, Dr. Wright, to hear that. I wish I could say the same thing at my university. We, we don't quite have that type of a, um, a ground swelling of, of um, training. What I will say is I think that it's, it's important to go back to how I moved into this position if you ask about allies, because the 100 Black faculty and staff that supported that letter have continued to be important allies in this process. And in addition, we've been able to really drive the narrative as it relates to the types of initiatives coming out of the statements that we see on campus from departments and colleges. And I say that because any of these efforts has to have the support across racial lines, across college lines. And my university has 50,000 students with 13 colleges. And so that makes it even more important that we do that. So I, I had the support and I continue to have the support of black faculty and staff. What's always also been an unexpected source of um, support has been the USF Faculty uh, Senate. And so this is a body that I didn't really know as much about when I first moved into the position, but I've really been able to leverage um, my engagement with them to, to develop some of the infrastructure necessary for the type of curricular changes that we're talking about, for some of the types of initiatives related to faculty recruitment. That Senate also created a resolution about anti-Blackness in particular, which was really important in terms of, again, creating a language, a common language that we could use to talk about this. Um, and this, this may seem like a, a small issue, but what I've realized is that when I moved into the position, I think I had assumptions about what people understood related to racism and anti-Blackness in particular. And those assumptions were, were misplaced because most folks did not understand what that meant. They, they, could, not they could not articulate why is it that racial equity uh, needs to be centered? Why is it, how, what is it about Blackness that makes it something that we need to talk about? And so, so much of this process has been about um, an education piece. So that training that Dr. Wright mentioned, I think is absolutely essential. Uh, but what we're realizing is that we've had to be even more intentional about making sure that that DNI training actually includes race and racism, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there's a whole, um, there's there's a whole reasonable concern about the ways that um, it's easy for universities to talk about diversity and inclusion, much more complicated when the question of anti-racism, racial equity are at the table. And so part of what my role has been to do has been to usher in those conversations that allow us to be honest about the, the how central racism, how central anti-Black racism is, and help us to move forward with those um, with that language and that framework in mind. And that, that itself has been a challenge, but there have been lots of uh, faculty and staff and leadership allies um, that have supported this. Um, but what, what I'm actually hoping to do is, is move, forward, move towards another language that's not just allies, but rather accomplices, mm -hmm. right? So if we think about some of the language that activists are using, um, rather than allyship, we mm -hmm. really want people who are willing to risk something, mm -hmm. put something on the line to really be able to move um, the policies and practices towards that end goal that we're all talking about. 
I really like the accomplices. I, I really do like that. So when you are um, asked about why, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about black folks and stuff? You know, you, you may have a long version and a short version of that response. Kind of give us the medium version of, you know, how do you respond to that? <clears throat> well, I think the way that I respond to this, I'm typically asked to respond to this in the context of a, a presentation. So I kind of have this standard presentation that I give. And what I have to do is I, I show this, um, this timeline of American history to help people understand, number one, the historical context of understanding the experiences of what's happening with Black folks. Um, people in the audience are typically compelled by data about education, not necessarily higher ed, but when I show them data about primary education, the school to prison pipeline, the ways that we see some of the inequities uh, be compounded through structural racism, right? So making the connections between residential segregation, educational disparities, access to jobs and education. It, it's really about creating a more holistic account giving people a holistic view of, of how uh, Black folks are uniquely disadvantaged in the system, both historically and at the contemporary level. That's been a huge part of, of, the, of the learning and education piece that, that folks just didn't know typically um, when, when those conversations begin. So that, for me, that's been key. And Dr. Wright, you might have a, a different yeah. approach, but. Yeah, uh, what I was going to say is, uh, Ms. Looney mentioned at the beginning how we might be the right persons uh, at our respective universities to be engaged in this. Uh, as a history professor, I've been teaching since uh, I finished at Duke in 1977. In every class or in virtually every presentation, I've said, what concerns me is that we, the American public, we don't have honest, open dialogues on race and race relations, that we wait until a crisis has occurred. The problem is the death of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, while it can lead to conversations, it's not the time if you haven't had trust with other people, if you haven't already developed the relationship. So it can very easily be when someone says something that you disagree with, that you then take the, a certain kind of uh, opinion about them and the same about you. That if you have race as a dialogue consistently and for as long as I, I've also said, we need to look at the symbols in our society at all of the universities I've been affiliated with in the South. There are Confederate symbols that are there and these things and what do those mean need to talk about. Then the other thing, the University of Kentucky and Duke University gave me an opportunity that far too many black and underrepresented folk don't get today. I graduated from high school because of social promotion. I didn't do anything in high school. My fault, nobody else's fault. But two months after I graduated from of high school, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And the University of Kentucky said they had a special program for blacks who had graduated from Lexington high schools that summer. I went out there and they said, if you maintain a B average, we'll give you a Martin Luther King scholarship. I had not made Bs in high school, but that program opened up a door to where nine years later, I had a PhD from Duke and it opened the door that I'm now 71, new opportunities like I have now still come my way. But why aren't those opportunities there for other people? That's a good so question. You, you know, one of the things- That's motivation for me. What I want, I want to come back to um, this point that I'm, uh, this, uh, this statement I'm gonna make now, uh, at the Board of Visitors meeting this weekend, George, you remember President Price and, and something that's coming through to me, what you, what you all are saying is that diversity and, and inclusion, these, these, these should not be initiatives. Yeah. The, the, this, this, these, these are, this is what should flow through everything that we do at a place called Duke and higher education. You know, initiatives, you know, it's, it's a very limiting word, but this should flow through everything that we do. And I, I hear when you're talking about it, that's what you're saying. And you're taking the historical perspective. I, I love the fact that we have a historian and a sociologist who are now taking on this work. But Elizabeth, you, you talked about resources and infrastructure. Let's yeah. have that conversation. Or let's, yeah. let's, let's have a moment with that. 
historically, much of the DNI and I'll just diversity and inclusion work comes with limited authority and limited resources. And perhaps this is changing uh, as this work seems to be more and more important to the leaders of, of, of universities now. Let's talk about how about the importance of having influence and authority in your positions. Influence, let me define them. Influence being having power to make changes and authority being having the power to make decisions to direct control. How do we ensure that diversity and inclusion positions have both influence and authority? That, that's, that's a tough question and that, that's actually the fundamental question here, right? Because it's the question between how do we ensure that this isn't just performative and how do we, how do we move from this performative superficial approach to something that is more substantial and institutionalized, right? That's what I think both Dr. Wright and I are talking about. And I, I appreciate being asked this because there's some interesting studies about implicit bias and training and what it does and what it actually doesn't do, right? So I'm all for conversation, but if, if that conversation stays in the realm of conversation and is never elevated to um, how our power and resources redistributed in a system, then, then we're not making the progress that we need to make. So your question is a good one, and it's one that I'm still struggling with. You know, so what we know typically is when this works well, the, there's not just one person who does this, right? So we're used to having a more centralized role, uh, centralized position. There, there are other models for how to do this, right? We can imagine having decentralized models. We can imagine several people being trained and having the expertise uh, to be able to, to execute these um, uh, 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 an, an institutional strategy or strategic plan rather than like you were saying the the initiatives mm -hmm. uh, that takes support from the provost that takes support from the president at a public university like mine that that has a number of pressures this position comes at an awkward moment where we're saying there's a lot to be done but there are some challenges to 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 securing I think the funding necessary for this and in my case the provost has been really great in terms of having me work with our office of decision support to build the infrastructure for the data part. Um, that, that's actually, for, for me, the most exciting part is that we, we have this data, we can create this infrastructure or what, what I call um, the DARE dashboard, the diversity, anti-racism and equity dashboard, which allows us to do a full institutional racial equity analysis, use that data as the basis for establishing our, our baseline, developing our um, goals and creating um, accountability structures to help us track our progress. That, that's important, but we also have to have the funding to make sure that the goals that we're trying to reach are supported. And again, that, that's, we're, we're in the midst of a, a, what we call a strategic renewal where the president will soon make decisions about how funding will be allocated. Um, equity in, and anti-racism is at the center of that strategic plan, but I think we're still waiting to see what the financial piece will look like. And, um, there's a lot of nervousness around that because the, the funds funds are tight right now. Yeah, so so George, we'll let you respond and then there's a question from uh, from Eduardo. Okay, first of all, uh, as, as has already been stated, it's important that DE&I type of initiatives not just be relegated to one office, but it permeates the university. Uh, the position of vice president of OID, again, I'm there as an interim, we're in the process of filling it. That individual will be one of the five vice presidents as part of the president's cabinet. My position as senior advisor to the president, I will also be part of the president's cabinet. So I will be at the table, that individual will be at the table. The, the position of OID has 2.752, uh, $2,750,000 recurring money each year to enhance faculty uh, that, that let's say uh, throughout the University of Kentucky, including the medical school, ag uh, um, agriculture, so forth, if a, if a person is hired and that person is Hispanic or African-American, we will help supplement that individual salary for the first two years, including startup funds with those monies. Also, uh, the University of Kentucky, like a lot of universities, has done a pretty good job in hiring but then not in returning, um, uh, re uh, re uh, keeping and not in enhancing the career. So we're now using monies there. 
uh, this fall with the start of my position of uh, something called the Parker Scholarship Funds, named for a longtime administrator of UK, some $19 million is used to help recruit undergraduates uh, uh, to the University of Kentucky. Lyman T. Johnson was the first African-American admitted to the University of Kentucky. We have some 40 to 50 scholarships for graduates, uh, uh, I sh should say fellowships for graduate students. So there is money attached. And also very quickly, I'll mention through this DE&I initiative, I am contacted by all sorts of parts of the university when a group anywhere in the university may say, we wanna start talking about race. We wanna bring in a speaker. We wanna have a film. There are monies that I have that I can give to, to help them get started in their DE&I activities. So it's very important that the position have funding and all of these funds I've mentioned are recurring dollars uh, at the University of Kentucky. So, so Eduardo, I'm going to ask you to unmute and ask your question that's in the chat. Hello, hello, Elizabeth. Hello, hello. Dr. Wright. So my question is an eternal question for us as people of color, yeah? So we struggle and the struggle is what brought us to these places, to these uh, historically white colleges and universities. So the issue is that on the one hand, we are desperately needed yeah, as administrators, as faculty, as students, as everything. But then when you get into administration, the issue is how to keep it real. And that's what I put in the question. I think Jacqueline, that's what I put here. How to keep it real, how not to be co-opted, depoliticized, and not ask just to do what Elizabeth called performance. Yeah? Universities also need us now in these performance positions. They do throw a little bit of money. So Professor Wright, you are right. It's important to get the money, but more than the money, I want power. I want the power to be able to say no to departments and uh, institutes and even uh, uh, colleges who are not doing right. And a lot, I mean, I, I'm now a senior scholar. So I have plenty of my students doing a version of what Elizabeth is doing. And my sad uh, concern is that for the most part, and again, we may have a difference here, yeah? the, the issues between performance and the needs of the college to keep it real with their donors and the donors have a different take usually from what uh, good actors want to do. So again, how to keep it real so you don't become just window dressing. Okay. That, that is definitely an Eduardo question. Um, I, I can appreciate that. And you know, what, what's interesting, you asked this question, I think the way that it was phrased is, you know, becoming a person of color in administration at an HWCU. And unfortunately, being a person of color, whether you're at Duke as a graduate student or anywhere else, requires this other level of emotional labor, especially when the work is related to race and racism. And, and it's unfortunately part, kind of part and parcel of what it means to have to navigate certain different spaces. But the question still stands is how can we do this without being co-opted? And that's such a great question. And it's, it's a question that I think I'm able, it's something that I'm able to deal with well because I have that group and part of those black faculty and staff members who are part of now uh, a, a steering committee. So I actually meet with them once a week. And I think that it's important for me to maintain this connection because they keep me honest. They, they, they ask me when it sounds like I'm, I'm just repeating the party line. Um, they'll, they'll say, okay, Elizabeth, step back. Let, let's, let's deconstruct what you've just said. And I think that having those checks and balances uh, is really important because it's easy. And I think easier than I thought to be exposed to these, these kind of narratives about your institution and be required to repeat those narratives and not necessarily question them. And so I think that um, having, continuing to have those conversations with folks who are, are not necessarily embedded within the institution is actually a healthy way uh, to do that. But it, it's an ongoing challenge, especially as you ascend up the, the ladder, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to, um, to, to craft a narrative about the university that's balanced, that allows you the space to say, these are the great things about the university, but these are also the, the areas and opportunities of growth. Fortunately, in positions like this, 
part of my job is to do this, is to be critical. So I've, I've enjoyed what it means to be a senior advisor because I feel like I, I almost have more latitude now to say what I think. Um, hopefully that continues to be the case. Um, but, but I have a feeling that as these positions change, it becomes a bit more difficult uh, to do that. Um, but I'd be, I'd be curious about Dr. Dr. Wright's take on that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll say this, not just because we're at Duke University, but if you ask me of all the people I've met in higher education, who do I most admire? Well, it's very simple, John Hope Franklin. Um, given my scholarship, I've always known of John Hope Franklin. I finished my PhD at Duke the year before John Hope Franklin arrived, but a lot of people erroneously thought I'd worked with him. I actually had worked with Ray Gavins. In any event, by the 1980s, when I'm at the University of Texas, John Hope Franklin started coming over to UT to do research. John Hope Franklin would be the primary one responsible for me receiving an endowed chair at Duke University. I point that out because while I've been fortunate enough to hold a wide range of administrative uh, positions, president 14 years, provost eight years and the like, I say it almost every day and I think there are a thousand audiences that can vouch for this, that I said, I am a university professor masquerading as a college president. I never forgot those roots. Uh, in that regard. And that's what kept me grounded. My last six years as president of Prairie View a and I taught a class every semester that had 300 students in it. Now at the University of Kentucky, I teach a course that's a comparative study of slavery in the Americas. And were it not for COVID, my students were going to Cape Town and Re uh, San Paulo and Rio de Janeiro with me. And I still hope that to do that kind of thing. That's what kept me real. Then the other thing is that something very striking happened. If, I, if anyone were to ask me how wonderful Duke was, I can tell them that. But I looked up and realized that in the program at the PhD at Duke, they actually admitted when I was there more African-American women than they had African-American men. And the women had better credentials in the sense of their undergraduate institution. More men graduated. Here's something I've said. At the predominantly white schools that I've been affiliated with, UT Austin, Duke University, University of Kentucky, they had to acknowledge that they were wrong on race. They found ways of justifying the absence of women. And so it's meant to me that part of diversity, part of all of this, even if you tell me women outnumber men, has to be a commitment on my part, a black person to women of all colors. And that that is an important aspect of what I do. That, that to me, uh, 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 that is, that is hallmark in that regard. So, so anytime I go any place and I don't see women adequately represented, it grounds me in what I'm supposed to be doing. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I don't consider myself an administrator first and last. I, I enjoy being, a, I am like John Hope Franklin, a history professor. And I hope you smile when you say this. Dr. Franklin lived into his 90s, which means I've got another 20 years to go. And my birthday is the same day as W.E.B. Du Bois. So it means I'm, I got to make it till I'm 95. So I've got okay. a way to go as a historian. Well, you know, uh, Professor Wright, you hit on a number of topics. I mean, there was a whole bunch you packed into that statement uh, about Duke, um, about, you know, what it had managed to do. But if, 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 if we go back, you came in the 70s, if we go back before the 70s, the moral argument in terms of the doing the right thing, the Duke Board of Trustees were not about to hear it. And Dean McLean did a beautiful presentation on the desegregation of higher education, where we talked about, you know, you know Duke deciding to desegregate because it wasn't gonna be prominent. Duke yeah. wasn't gonna get the grants. Mm -hmm. All those fine students from the East were not gonna to come to North Carolina to an, a, a segregated university. So that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. But Elizabeth, you hit on something about, George, you said the, you know, ascending the ladder. 
So let's talk about that. And I'm looking at, I'm looking right at Elizabeth Horridge Freeman because she knows I'm coming with this question. Here you are, promising young scholar, still doing your scholarship, using your scholarship to inform the work that that university, your university should be doing. So, you know, what does this lead to for you in your career as you look at whatever those next steps are. So here, here's my thing. Let me just say this before, that I, I think that my colleagues who tend, we, tend to do this type of work have incredible skills, can do the research, can do the management, can do all of that, mm -hmm. but they get pigeonholed mm -hmm. into diversity and inclusion. And the things that it takes to create infrastructure, to raise resources, to manage teams are the th same things that it takes to do global education, to run a department, to do all of those things. But those things, there, se there seems to kind of like not see the Elizabeth Horridge Freemans as, as the provost or whatever. And, and that may not be for you. I mean, that, I don't think that that'll be your case, but, but you take my point, right? Where, where does this lead to a young scholar, tenured associate professor, award-winning books and now doing this work? What does that mean? This is such a really uh, great question. And I mean, I think that there, that question has two parts, right? There, there's my progression to full, which for me is important. And unfortunately, I just finished this book. I just signed the contract. So the full book is done, which is great. But part of my conversations with the president and provost upon taking this position was to say, uh, I have I have other ambitions here. So my expertise fits this, um, but I will take this only with the condition that I'm mentored to be able to, to pivot out of this position into something that allows me to draw on those sensibilities, but has a much broader uh, impact. And so um, that, that concern was something that I, I directly um, addressed with the president and provost. And so in many ways, they've helped me to develop some of the skills needed to not just be D, D and I. And in fact, that that's not, those, those are not my plans. I, I do see myself more in line of a provost, president track. And so that was something that they had, that they know about, that they've been extremely supportive in. And they, we've already started having conversations about how in this moment, I'm in the senior advisor role, but there are other plans for how I'll pivot out of this at the end of the at the after the end of that period, and so for me, it was really important to be intentional about that. Um, and for some of us, we do enjoy the DNI um, position. I'm not necessarily taking that away from folks who want to be in that position, but that that's not those aren't my goals. And I, I think that I've had to be very intentional and strategic and reminding of the, the, the president and provost uh, of of where I'd like to go and and their role in helping me to get there. Unfortunately, I've worked with. They've been extremely supportive and just as equally intentional about helping me to develop those skills that are required to, to take uh, myself to the next level. I think the important thing about what you just said, Elizabeth, is that you put it on the table up front. A lot of us don't do that. And I think the fact that, that basically I'm going to translate what you said, hey guys, let's not get it twisted. I can do this work. For you right now but here's where i need to be and this is what i envision provost whatever yeah. in my future and i think that's very important and it's also instructional for the students who want to do their scholarship that are on who also want to get into administration and perhaps do some dni uh work as well well, let me also say this, Dr. Uh, Dean Looney, is, is that in some way, I mean, that's just my approach to things. I, I just like to put things out there, but that's also risky. And it's risky for somebody to hear black women say, no, I'm actually trying to be president one day. Pe people are still having a hard time processing that. And I realized that it was risky, but I thought it was important. It was important for me to be able to say that. It was important for me to take ownership of my career uh, because what I've always learned is that uh, these things, these types of positions don't just happen, and they certainly don't just happen on happenstance for, for Black women. And so I've had to, to, to take the bull by the horns in so many different parts of my life, and I just saw this as another example of me having to, to try to do as much of, try to direct my destiny as much as possible by being as explicit to them and with myself about where it is I see myself going. And I would like to think that uh, part of that kind of attitude has to do with 
how much Eduardo Bonilla Silva and John French and others pushed you as you were doing the work to get your done. And so I'm so proud of that. Uh, George, I, do you want to comment on that? And then after that, we'll pause and see okay. if other participants have questions. Okay. Um, because I, I've been fortunate enough to be both a provost and a president, I've been asked many times by, by people aspiring to those positions, how did I get there? What would I recommend to them? Well, I actually say, number one, whatever you do at a university or even in some other areas can lead to that. There is no one track uh, that will lead to that. It, it's a, it may seem old, an old adage, but do whatever it is you're doing to the best of your ability, work at it extremely hard, and that you might not know what that will lead to. Okay, that's number one. But I would not have made it to these positions had not someone took a special interest in me and mentored me. That I am convinced, I don't mean to take anything away from anybody who's made it to the top, but no one was president of the United States until they became president of the United States, meaning that no one had actually had that experience. So at some point, you have to take a chance. You can extrapolate. A person did this well, then why not give them that opportunity? Uh, Ms. Looney, you mentioned what DE&I type of work involves, that you have to build coalitions. You have to work with other folks. Every job I've had, I've had probably more set, I've lost more battles than I've won. Uh, I hate to tell you what my record is, 10 and 100 or something <laughs> like that in that regard. And so you have to learn from all of those things. And then you have to have someone who goes out of the way to give you an opportunity. As president, I felt an obligation that if you look at the, the, the longest stint of my time, three of my five vice presidents, the provost, the CFO, and dean of students were women, that I felt an obligation that I must do everything I can to mentor women so that would be taken off the table. So whatever you're doing, whether you're in education, whether you're in medicine, you can make it in those goals. And I'm okay with folk telling you what you do. And I'll say one other thing. Duke is, has a religious affiliation for George Wright. Not talking about anyone else. For George Wright, nothing has ever happened to me in life that I didn't ask God to be a hand in it. Okay? Take that for what it's worth. But uh -huh. everything that's ever happened to me, I ask God to let that happen to me. I, th I think this is, a, this is great. This is, this is a different conversation uh, in terms of race and bias. We've looked at issues. We've looked at, we've looked at uh, systemic racism. We've looked at structures. We talked about desegregation. And here we are talking about our colleagues who decide to take on this work, to, to incorporate this work. I'm sure Elizabeth and George, you're probably working on a couple of articles now about you know how, <laughs> and if you're not, you ought to. Um, and so this is different because it's important for our students, I think, and those and those uh, the others who are with us today to know what it means to take on this type of work and to know what you're getting yourself into as well. Right. Well, I want to I want to say a little bit more about um, this aspect of bias and what I've learned um, in a number of situations and and. And in some ways, this is a response to, to Dr. Wright, and in other ways, it's not. I'm thinking about someone who might be listening, who is the is like who I was back when I was getting a PhD, and and that is that in, in my life, I have always had to be strategic. I, I I could not afford not to be. And so when I would be in conversations, I, I've gone through several leadership conversations or development trainings, and I'd often see older white men talk about how luck got them to where they were. That was the dominant narrative about where they got, why they got there. You know, they just worked hard as though no woman had ever worked hard. And, and you know, it, it's, it's an interesting narrative, but bias plays out in a way that requires me 
to, to have this planned out the way that I have. Um, you're, Dr. Wright, you're, you're correct that there's no right path, but there's actually some important, some interesting trends as it relates to black women who become university presidents. And I don't think that, that it, it's, not a, it's not a coincidence that there's less latitude that when you deviate from a, a standard route, um, your competency is questioned, right? I'm not saying it should be, but we know how this happens. And so I, I think that those of us who are thinking about this route have to be very intentional. And I think the cultivation of mentors, mentors is absolutely important. Mentors across race, across gender is also important across institutions. Um, I'm, I'm, def that, I'm definitely putting that plug in to mean that I'll be in contact with you, Dr. Wright. Um, but over and above that, those contacts are really uh, important. And the decisions that we make you know, in some cases, we're not afforded the the luxury of making mistakes, right? I mean, part of what you, part of part of what you've talked about is, is giving yourself the freedom to make mistakes. But I, I also think that there's a pressure to 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 know that there's not much latitude you have for mistakes. And so, how do we deal honestly with that part of these conversations about how that type of bias impacts the decisions that we make, the risks that we're real, willing to take? All of these are part of a, converse, a broader conversation that needs to be had about mentorship and opportunity um, uh, for women and for Black women in particular. So Elizabeth, let me let me let me do a follow up to that because you know faculty and, and administrators of color are generally the ones doing the heavy lifting of this DNI work. How do we make this work everyone's responsibility on our campuses? This is this, the, these should not be initiatives. This should yeah. flow through everything the university does. Right. You know, so you know, one of the things, and I, I like this about what Dr. Wright was saying, is that this training component is, is a part of it because what we see is that folks are just uncomfortable even using the common language. So we can't expect folks to do the work when they won't even say race, black out loud, right? So that piece is important, but we also have to give people the resources to develop the expertise. And, you know, what, what's been interesting is this question of, I go back to this, and I've, I've been saying this, this infrastructure is so important. One of the things that I am advocating for at USF is that we have as our QEP, I don't know if Duke has one of these, we have what's called the Quality Enhancement Program, which is a program that every five years, universities that are, um, our accreditation requires that we select a topic for our QEP. And mm -hmm. once we decide on that topic, all colleges across the university have to embed uh, this focus in the curriculum. And so the idea is that anti-racism and racial equity be selected as the QEP, because if it is, this will allow us, it, it requires the university to, um, to invest a significant amount of funds and across the university, everybody is required to do this. Unfortunately, folks aren't gonna do this out of the goodness of their hearts, right? What we know is that folks respond to consequences, they respond to resources. And so putting in that infrastructure to, to propel things forward has to be part of this. Um, and so I'm excited about the potential to have that be institutionalized because that comes with the money and the infrastructure that will allow us to help usher in those, the changes that we're trying to see that might start with the curriculum, but obviously hopefully have an impact on student recruitment, faculty recruitment, faculty success and student success. George, did you want to add anything to that? And then we'll see what questions we no, have. No, I, I think I'm good with that. You're good. You're good. Mm -hmm. So now we'll open up. We have about, really, we're, we're doing great. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, any comments from our participants or questions? You can, we can use the raise hand. We can I wanted to give everyone else a chance to ask questions because you know I have <laughs> you know the questions. But George and Elizabeth, any in any comments? Um, uh, well, I do have a couple of comments. I was, you know, when I got this invitation to speak, I was I was excited because I've been following Duke and following what's been going on at Duke. And I, I've, you know, since graduating, I always keep track of what's happening. And um, I, I'd, I'd love to hear more from folks who were in this conversation about the extent to, to which you feel Duke is doing a, a good job with this. Uh, online, the the... The framework is amazing. It, it's in many ways best practice. And sometimes, and th this is actually 
oftentimes what happens is that you can have universities, not just Duke, have a really great program on paper, but the actual implementation, implication, implementation in real life experience, uh, sometimes uh, there, there's a mismatch. And so I'm very curious about this um, in terms of folks who are here at Duke. Eduardo might be interested in answering that question or perhaps somebody else who can speak to um, whether or not the extent to which you've been able to see some of the changes that Duke is outlining, has outlined online, do you experience that? Does it feel like there's institutional transformation? Eduardo? <laughs> I usually don't mess in the place I work, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut about what Doug is doing. And I will ask you, both of you, to dig deeper into the, the question that Dean Looney has asked or mentioned twice, which is how to make diversity not the prerogative of one of you I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember when these positions were created, yeah? Mm -hmm. Diversity uh, person, then vice provost for diversity. And usually, you know, a good, big salary, but you know, no, no food for you, so no power. And it was a, initially it was a, you know, decoration. So the issue is, as in Looney suggests, how to, trans, how to transition from diversity as diversity incorporated, mm -hmm into diversity as an effective collective practice. And just, Elizabeth, I'll give you one example of a corner of the question you asked to us about how Doug is doing. I gave a lecture uh, eight months ago at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I mentioned that the black taxation, yeah? Because they don't have enough of us, then we're, we're asked again and again and again, to serve in the committee, on the committee, on the committee, on the committee, on the committee. And I'm sick and tired of serving and serving and serving unpaid, yeah? This year I've received probably 10 different requests to participate, to lecture in classes, to do free labor. And you know what? I don't do free labor. Slavery is presumably over. So again, we need to, you need my services, my fee is this, you know. So again, the big question is how do we transfer into practices, concrete ways of forcing folks to be, be part of the in, engagement on diversity? You know, what, what I like about that question, uh, and I hope you don't mind me uh, answering Dr. Wright, oh, is, okay. is that it goes back to something um, that Dean Mooney was saying about um, what was the impetus behind some of the major changes at Duke? If people aren't just doing things because it's the morally right thing to do, what are the incentives that get people to change? And so when we think about other things that are important, you know, our, our standards for tenure, people know what the rules are and they, they follow them. They are, are doggedly um, aggressive at meeting those goals. I mean, we can think about how performance evaluations that focus on publications and a number of teaching of classes that you're teaching, there, there might be ways to institutionalize this requirement for everybody in a way that, that we don't typically have to elevate this evidence of your contribution to racial equity initiatives as something that faculty, uh, chairs, deans, provosts, and presidents have to show. What, what I like about what's happened at my university is that the provost suggested that part of the, the DARE dashboard that I've been developing, that we don't just develop it, but that it ends up being part of what the president and the provost have to respond to, to the board of trustees, right? So those are, those are their bosses. So when we elevate this work to not be a, a separate project, but now that the president is potentially held accountable for this, we start to get the type of movement that's necessary to get everybody involved, um, in a way that's much more institutional, but really being specific about it, uh, not just listing it as a requirement, but having accountability structures so that when people don't meet them, something happens, right? We, uh, because at, at, at this point, oftentimes folks are reporting on what they're doing, but if they're not doing anything particularly innovative or effective, that nothing happens. And so I think that that accountability structure has to be there and everybody has to, has to be held accountable for doing their part. And we have to also elaborate what that quote unquote part is in much more, um, in much clearer terms. I think that that's a, a really good beginning point uh, for seeing some of this change. Um, my comment oh, may in some ways seem contradictory and it may not adequately answer it. On the one hand, as a person who's been a college administrator, I know how to build requirements. What we say is important, you measure. 
uh, you make it part of evaluations, you make it things that people are required to do. So I understand that. I listened very cl closely this past Friday when President Price spoke. I, I really wanted to hear what he said, what Duke was doing and why Duke was doing it. And he made a number of comments that from my perspective, spoke to his own commitment about why something is the right thing to do. The president I worked for at the University of Kentucky, long before I went back there as an alum, I would read their newsletters and all of that. And I said, wow, I can't believe the comments this individual is making about diversity or making about the importance of MLK Day or other things. So it's people's commitments. But, but here's where, again, um, even though some people are doing it because it's a job for them, for me, I have to do it because, again, if I don't care how corny it sounds, if you think about when I was born, John Hope Franklin could not teach at the University of Kentucky. His credentials, look at the history department, 1950, look at John Hope Franklin's credentials. Uh, he was far more qualified. The same with W.E.B. Du Bois. All of the changes that happened on the civil rights movement, I was a, a, a person observing. I did none of those things. I then walked through the door that other people opened. Oh, if the world were fair, all those other people would have gone to UK and Duke and had those things. I get to come along and benefit. And so I have to find a way. So if other folk are not as committed, I think I understand. But I also learned something else from a person whose life I greatly admire. This would be uh, Nelson Mandela. And I do believe there is evolutionary change and that you have to work at it and work at it. And DEI at the University of Kentucky, and I suspect that Duke means that we started this last summer, but we're now in phase two. I will not be around for all of the other phases because we're supposed to, we're not supposed to stop. So I don't personally worry about them not paying me for things. I have long since been paid by UK and Duke and the others with the opportunities they gave me uh, uh, in that regard. So in other words, from whom much has been given, much is expected and much is expected of me because I, again, I'll go back. I'm willing to challenge you all. I bet I had the lowest high school grades of everybody on this program <laughs> today. Well, let me, we have two questions, George. This is, we have two questions in the, in the chat and I do want to get to them. So we may go over a couple of minutes. And so, Anne, I'm going to let you ask your question. And then Elizabeth, I'll let you ask your question. We'll start with Anne. All right. Hi, um, panelists. This has been so instructive and I'll, a special shout out to Dr. Wright because I'm also a historian by training, um, although I did my PhD at Carolina. So uh, sorry. And, and I have a great deal of respect. I could go on all afternoon about the great scholars in race at Carolina, starting with Joel Williamson. So I could just go on the rest of the afternoon. About and we could talk about Joel Williamson, who was on my committee. But, um, but setting that aside, I'm currently, uh, I appreciated both of your remarks so much. It's a lot to think about here. I'm currently the director of the Graduate Liberal Studies Program, the MALS program at Duke. And, um, and I'm a historian who's become very engaged in issues and uh, histories of race in a, in a lot of different areas. Um, I really liked, um, uh, Dr. Hard Freeman, what you said about becoming an accomplice, moving from allyship to accomplice. That, that's like, like that word. Yeah. Yeah. plotting together um, to, to bring change. And I really want that. I want to do that myself. I want to do it on behalf of our program. I was also sensitive to what um, Professor Bonilla Silva said about, you know, um, black faculty in particular and black staff being called upon to be on every committee and do everything. Our program uh, is serving um, a community, a, a diverse community, and we haven't had as many black faculty involved over time in the program as we would like. In any case, my question is, what suggestions do you have for those of us white people who want to be allies, who want to be accomplices, who want to help carry the labor, who want to embed this work in our own work, um, 
to do so effectively, helpfully, and also not sort of take up too much space in the conversation at times. So anyway, that's my question, thanks. Well, and I thank you for your question and for, and for being so thoughtful with it as well and, and being concerned about how, how whiteness and white privilege can spill over into these, into these spaces where we presumably that shouldn't happen. I think that there are a few things I have in mind. I think that um, this question often comes up and when it does, the first step is also is always to say, um, have you educated yourself on this issue? This is not necessarily directed to you, Anne, but in general, that's the first question. Um, what we see is white folks are, are interested, they're excited about making a difference, but they don't necessarily know the history or the sociology of, of what the topic is. But after that, I think that there's something really important about that distinction between allyship and accomplice and, and being an accomplice. And this is a process, right? And an ally typically doesn't put anything on the line when they support you. No, it could, it could kind of be after the meeting comes over, um, you kind of say something positive. There, there's nothing, you've risked nothing, that your power and privilege is not at play. At my university, there's a person, a, a white man in particular, who is always using his privilege in a way to say things that would not be acceptable if anybody else said him. And, and he knows that. And he uses very public spaces to, to insert these comments and these critiques. He's also a member of other boards that have power where he's also wielding his influence. And so when you talk about being an accomplice, it's really about not just owning your own power and privilege, but owning how your embeddedness in certain networks and power structures give you an opportunity um, to use that space in order to, to advance uh, anti-racism. And I think that takes some reflection. I think oftentimes or sometimes white folks haven't necessarily thought about the networks in which they're embedded. They're so taken for granted that they've never stopped to think about how their position on the, the, the executive committee or the tenure and promotion committee or on the faculty senate could actually be used. And maybe it's not even that structure. Maybe it's about proposing a substructure of the organization that you're in that, that can do that work. And so um, the, the last part of that is sometimes the gap becomes is that uh, white folks are interested in doing the work, but they aren't really around people of color. They have no relationships with people of color. They feel awkward interacting with people of color, Black people in particular, because they don't have, they're not even part of a, a network of other folks. And so that's a problem that also has to be addressed, right? So thinking about this is not just a, a, a university problem, but how does the same issue play out in your own life? And what are some of the kind of personal, uh, personal work that you have to do to be able to be an effective accomplice? Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but I, I hope it, I hope that there's something that you can glean from those comments as, as you go forward or perhaps as other people go forward. I, you know, I think and we are, we, we are, and I do want to be mindful of time and, and Elizabeth, I will have to apologize to you, but we are at time. Um, and this has been great. And, and, and I want to uh, put, put Elizabeth on the spot because I see a very short feature piece for the Duke Graduate School's webpage on allies versus accomplices, and that could be a part of of a part of the race and bias, you know, takeaways. Um, so I will be connecting with you <laughs> to see if we can get something like that. George, I'll give you if you have any last comments you want to make. Elizabeth, I will take that response as your last word, and George, give you a moment, and then I, I will close this out. And I apologize. I did not say at the beginning, uh, like my colleague did, about how much of an honor it is to be on this program today to maintain this affiliation with Duke. And so I, I thank you for inviting me uh, uh, to participate today. Well, thank you. And I want to thank my colleagues who've joined us, Dean McLean, Professor Eduardo Bonilla Silva. I just love it. I love the, <laughs> just love the rhythm of your name and everyone else. So thank you so much. I do want to let you know that our next conversation, our last conversation for this semester is Wednesday, March 24th. And the topic is position, power and property, racial economic inequality in the United States. States. And that will be featuring our, our own Professor William Darity, uh, who is the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy. Uh, don't miss it at all. And thank you all and all my colleagues who helped behind the scenes to get this going. Elizabeth, George, Dean McLean, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. There's, there's, there's much work to do 
Today's, this week's Chronicle of Higher Education had a really nice piece by an undergraduate on the desegregation of Duke. And um, one of the things I mentioned in the article is that in 1975, when the President's Council on Black Affairs was formed, uh, you know, uh, um, Bill Turner was the one professor, one of our former professors, Emeriti, and, and, and there were 11 issues that the black community was concerned about at that time. And guess what? Those 11 issues are still on the table. And so the students said, said have, have we done, what are we doing? Have we made progress? I said, since 1987, absolutely we've made progress. We're still de dealing with those issues, but we have so, so much more work to do. But I do think that part of the progress is having folks like our faculty members to engage this, to use your scholarship in a way that informs this very important topic. So thank you all so, so much. And, and as we get through the other side of this pandemic, just had my first shot of Pfizer, and I'm feeling good that you will take some kindness today and give it to someone else. So thank you so, so much. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you.